So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Rhonda. So let me pull up this information. So thank you for joining us today, Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda J. Miller is a reporter and audio producer for WKU Public Radio in Bowling Green, Kentucky. She won a 2020 uh, second place Green Eye Shades Award from the Society for Professional Journalists for the public, uh, for public Service in Radio Journalism for a series of stories on hunger in Kentucky. She won a 2019 Kentucky Associated Press First Prize Award for Best Public Radio Reporter. Uh, Rhonda has worked at, as the Gulf Coast reporter for Mississippi Public Broadcasting, where she won the Edward R. Murrow and Associated Press Awards for stories about dying sea turtles, illnesses of cleanup workers in the BP oil spills, and homeless veterans. She has been a reporter for the Rhode Island Public Radio, South Florida Sentinel, and Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, Rhonda teaches an online writing and podcasting courses for the Creative Nonfiction Foundation based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So welcome, Rhonda, and thank you so much uh, for, um, for uh, sharing your wisdom with us today. I'm going to turn you. it over to you. Thank you, Amber. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, and you know, when I, I've been doing radio and, and podcasting teaching for quite a while, and now all of a sudden everybody's doing podcasting, and everybody is now isolated and at home. And so there are just a lot more, um, a lot more reasons to do podcasting. So it's really, um, it's really kind of a good time to get into it. So um, I would like to just, um, I would like to just start by saying that there are seven basic steps that I've worked on uh, that'll help you start a good podcast. And it just depends on uh, what you want to do, you know, what you want to use your podcast for. Um, so it's creative and there are a lot of different elements to podcasting. Uh, it's vision, you have to have an idea, then there's a lot of audio production and then oh, actually it's a lot of fun. So um, I just think that you ha it's good to keep these different elements in balance. So I'm going to start with one of my favorite podcasts, it's short, and I'm starting with this especially because I know a lot of people listen to long podcasts and they listen to conversations. And when if you're a runner, you listen to long podcasts. But this is really a short one. And I am going to um, play this one because it has a lot of great elements in it. And this one is called Soundbeat. Some believe Elvis liked a little Nashville studio so much that he never left. You're on the sound beat. You're listening to I Was the One, the B-side to Elvis's first RCA single, Heartbreak Hotel. He recorded the songs at Nashville's RCA studio months earlier, and while it was later converted to a TV studio, some claim Elvis never, well, left the building. Legend has it, whenever Presley's name was mentioned, lights would blow out and unexplained noises would respond, sometimes over the PA system. The next time you see Elvis's ghost, you can let everyone know. The King has his own iPhone app with a special built-in feature for logging Elvis sightings. Yeah, there's an app for that. Sign up for our podcast at iTunes and at soundbeat.org. Thank you. Thank you very much. Soundbeat is produced at the Belfer Audio Archive, Syracuse University Library. I'm Brett Barry. So I love that podcast because it has so many different great elements in it. Um, so I'm going to, so here are the seven basic elements that I think make up a good podcast. Vision focus, recording equipment, writing, production, distribution, and audio editing. So first of all, like for vision, Soundbeat has a very specific vision and message. It's for people to learn about the history of sound. 
And I'm not sure that people would be that interested until they heard Sound B because it's always fascinating uh, and it's always different. It has music, it has a spoken word, and then with every little one and a half minute podcast, there's a backstory. There's a story of how, what it's about and how they found all that. Um, the recording equipment, I've listened to this a lot, a long time, and they use wax cylinders, a really, a, you know, an older form of recording. They have records and then they have recorded speeches. So they use a lot of different uh, elements of recording. Uh, writing is, writing is an important thing in podcasting. And I think maybe some people don't think of it as writing because a lot of podcasting is sort of conversation. But the thing about Soundbeat is from the very first minute, from the very first second, you know, uh, they say, oh, some people think Elvis never left. And then they suggest a ghost. And then, you know, there's music and the story. And then at the end they say, oh, there's an app for that. So it covers so much territory and so much time. It starts, you know, back with Elvis and then he's in Nashville and then it ends with an app for that. So it brings you right up to now. So, I mean, I think when you're writing for your podcast, you have to think about how much time you have and what you want to get into that amount of time. Um, uh, production, you know, that's a great production. There's music, there's voice, uh, there's other sound. At the beginning, they have that like old scratchy record sound, which is kind of cool. So um, there are a lot of different elements of production. The distribution part of it. I know people want to know how to distribute it. And, you know, that's, I always say, just try to get the podcast done first. But um, that sound beat is, distrib is distributed mainly on its website. It's Syracuse University, and they have their own web page. But it's also free to radio stations. So any radio station can use it. And, you know, I hear it every day on the radio. Um, and then audio editing. That's something we'll look at a little bit later, but they're great audio editors. So those are the seven, those are the seven basic parts. So um, I'll just go into a little bit of some of those in case people want to um, start a podcast or already have an idea for a podcast. Um, start with a broad vision, something broad, like uh, is it going to be gardening, cooking, running, parenting, travel? Um, that's your start. And then let's say you have your own business, you know, maybe... Um, maybe you have a bicycle repair shop and you want to start a podcast about bicycle rides in your neighborhood or your community. Um, you want to start with the broad vision and then focus it down to something really narrow. Like um, if you want to do a music podcast, it doesn't mean you're going to review new, new music. You could do Cajun music uh, or jazz or jazz of a particular era, you know, so just keep it very, very specific. Uh, and that's why I think you have to figure that out. It's like in any TV show or something, you have to kind of have a storyline and start with your, you know, beginning, middle, ending, and, and make sure that you stay on your focus for your podcast. So um, I do have another one that I want to play, and it's called... Um, it's also short. I happen to like short podcasts. So um, some of them are longer, but this one is called Bird Note. And I like it because it's very interesting. I love birds and I never know, um, I never know like what they sound like really. I've never, I don't know much about them, but this is a good podcast. Too. This is Bird Note. <laughs> Ever wonder how birds were named? Some, such as the Wilson Snipe were named for people, others for a distinguishing physical characteristic, like the spotted toey, and some for geographic locations, like the California quail. In a few cases, the bird's song or vocalization is incorporated into its name. Let's listen to a few birds that call their names. Do you recognize this chick-a-dee-dee-dee call? That's the black-capped chickadee. How about the bobwhite? The northern bobwhite. Listen again. And this bird? The killdeer is a common shorebird that often uses this alarm call when predators approach its nest. 
So um, I like that because I love birds and I never know which bird is singing. I have a lot of trees where I live. And so that is a very specific two minute podcast. And I, what I want to emphasize is you can really put a lot into two minutes or five minutes. So I try not to think too big. I think at the beginning, think something very specific. Um, okay. We could look a bit at recording equipment. Uh, and, um, I, I have, I have some basics and I know people may have questions. So, um, you can let me know if they do, but let's, let's just look at the, a short, a short kind of overview of equipment. Um, this is, I'm not going to get into great detail because there's so much about equipment that the more you do it, the more equipment you find out about. But this is sort of an overview um, from the podcast course I teach. Um, and I, I would encourage you at this point, I never used to do this in my course that I teach, but I now just let people start, you know, just say, start with your, start with your smartphone. It's very easy. And I have to say, not to say that iPhones are better than others, but I do a lot of iPhone recording that are, that's used for broadcast. Um, if you, I don't know if, if you all have tried it, but iPhone voice memo is a really good recording app. And you know, the other phones have that have these voice uh, recording apps too. This just happens to be really good quality for whatever reason. And here's something you could, I mean, here's a simple way to start uh, an interview. You could call someone on zoom, start a video chat on zoom, and then have them take their iPhone, hold it up, turn on voice memo app, record, record the interview, and then just email it to you. And then you download it and then you edit it. Uh, and I've done that a lot and it's really good sound. Some people have um, done it several times and some people have never done it. And as long as they record, turn the recording button on and off and email it to you, it's usually pretty good. It's usually very good sound. Sometimes it sounds like studio sound. It's just amazing. Um, but the other, you know, the other phones have that app too. So you can use that. Um, headset, you should have a good headset. I know people use earbuds and all that, and that's okay. Uh, it is really good to have headphones or a headset with a mic. Um, and it's good to have a headset that covers your ears so you can cancel out all the other noise and, and listen. Uh, you should use those while you're recording. And also when you're editing your sound, um, just so you can hear all the little details of, of what's in the audio file. Um, podcast microphone, you um, don't have to buy a really expensive podcast microphone. This is one that's pretty good. There, you, there, there are some ones that may not have good quality. And if you want to do a podcast, you should have good quality. This is a Blue Yeti. It's a little expensive. It's over $100, but it connects right into a USB. Um, and if you're going to do podcasting at your desk with your computer, you know, you should get something, not necessarily this, but something pretty good. I actually use my microphone plugged into a recorder into the USB, but you know, you can jerry rig things. Um, I have these speakers. They're not too expensive. I listen. I like to listen to them. Uh, whenever I'm editing, I listen to the process of editing on my speakers. And then I also listen on my headphones. Then I go back and listen on my speakers. And um, it was funny because I bought these a while back. And then I went to the, I was at the Boston Globe last year on a, with an audio group. And we toured the newsroom and every desk had these speakers. So uh, I don't know. They just, I just turned out to Pick good ones, they're nice. Uh, digital recorders. There are a lot of them. And you know, you don't have to get anything too fancy, but you do have to make sure it has good sound. The most common ones are Zoom and Tascam. Uh, probably the most common one is Zoom H5. Uh, it's just really popular with audio producers, radio people. Um, you can use the little mics that are on it 
or even better and what I do with it is I plug in another cable an XLR cable and use an external microphone I like to get like really uh, close-up sound so it gives you the more close-up sound and this has different channels so um, people use it to record two people but I don't really like to do that um, and I'm not saying this is the best recorder but I'm just I have these reviews of this particular recorder just because the main thing I think you need to do is if you want to do podcasting is just do a lot of reading about all the equipment and it, after a while it's just going to be so much but eventually it'll clear up and so this one tells you about you know another um, microphone you can use a shore mic an omni mic which is like really good for outdoors uh, there's another mic it suggests some headphones and um, there's another one and it just tells you the okay so if you want equipment I would say first of all don't go on eBay and buy something you aren't sure what you're getting especially if it's used um, I know someone ordered a mic on eBay and uh, it didn't come with the correct didn't come with any cable so then you have to figure out what cable. So it's really better to find a company that you like, that you trust, like B&H is a good company and I bought a lot from Sweetwater. Um, call them up and say, what, you know, this is what I wanna do. I wanna do field recording or I wanna do interviews or I wanna work from my desk. And, you know, just chat with them and see what they suggest. And then after they suggest things, you know, do some more reading. and just do a lot of background and and buy from a reputable dealer. Um, I do have like a like a music shop in my neighborhood and I bought a few small things like you know a mic stand or something but um, a lot of music shops are kind of geared to bands and musicians so um, it's a little bit different they're not you want to make sure that people are familiar with uh, interviews and podcasting. And microphones, this is just a way to read about microphones. It's an online review, mics for podcasting. And the best place to look online for anything about audio is Transom. Transom.org, it's written by people that do recording all the time. Um, and there's everything about microphones and recorders and production and just everything you want to know and they review everything that comes out so i would just say if you this is a good place to start transom.org transom.org and just go there and uh and take a look at that so um there is a lot more about equipment but it just depends on uh <laughs> you know on on what people want to do and and what they want to get so um let's see i think that's yeah so anyway i just um want to encourage people to to start to kind of start small and not not get too involved but but experiment mm -hmm. uh, I, want to do sh I do want to show you one way to record that i've been using lately and i think it, it's really it really is meant for podcasting uh it's called it's called squadcast and i want to show you that so, oops. Okay, this is this is um, this is a platform that is particularly made for podcasting. And the way it works is you. It looks like a Zoom session. You are having a video chat with someone, but each person is recording. And the good thing about this is the person you're interviewing is being recorded and you're being recorded and then it records both of you you can get each one separately or you can do a mix so i've been using this um pretty often lately these are the these are the interviews i've done lately on this two, basic two-way recording um there's a free there's a free trial session you can use and then it's I don't know it's like ten dollars a month so it's, it's pretty good um there are a couple of important details about this the person you're interviewing has to have a microphone and a headset so uh and then they have you know they have to plug it in so like um a headset with a mic that people use for video games that works well i just did an interview and that that worked really well um 
even the uh, earbuds with the little mic for, for an iPhone that works well. And then each side should have a mic and a headset. Otherwise it can sound really far away and echoey, but I'm going to, um, I'm gonna just show you one of these that I did recently. And um, you can see that this is with a doctor, Dr. Morton, her files are there, my files are there, and then they, you can mix them. And <laughs> the thing about this is it's a, it's a 13 minute interview and it's in finished form, it's four minutes. So I'm just going to play the beginning and this is kind of a setup. Like when you're starting your interview basically, um, I always take a few minutes to just chat, get their name, how to say their name, pronounce it, spell it, their title, and then um, check the sound. See if the sound is good, see if it's echoing, see if it's, you know, um, it, it's clear on both sides. So here- And we'll just make sure. Um, so um, I have that we're recording and yeah. Um, and be, before, let, let me just ask you how you like to, um, um, I'm gonna make sure that my mic and everything are working properly. Oops, no, wait a minute. Now it changes on me, hold on. Uh, yeah, default, default, yeah, it should be okay. Um, um, I just wanna ask you first how I should introduce you and, I, and I'll, you know, we'll go into the, I won't start the, record. I mean, it's recording, but I won't use this part. Just how should I introduce you? Cause you have a lot of titles. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I think it's safe to say, you know, Dr. Laura Morton, I'm an associate professor at University of Louisville. I'm a geriatrician. Um, and I think that's important to say. And you can also say I'm a certified medical director. So that's important for the long-term care setting. So that would probably be another, um, yeah, so I think those would be the main type. I know I have a lot of hats that I wear. Those are the most important ones, I think. It's great. Okay, so um, I'll just I'll just give a short intro. Um, I'm talking with Dr. Laura Morton. She's an uh, tell tell me that again. <laughs> associate professor of geriatrics. I'm talking with Dr. Laura Morton. She's an associate professor of geriatrics at the University of Louisville School of Medicine, and. Um, the other part is you also do... So I would say, you can say that I'm, um, you can say that I'm a certified medical director. So that's the, the part for being a medical director for long-term care facilities. Okay, she's also, and she's also a certified medical director for long-term care facilities. Okay, that's great. Um, so Dr. Morton, thank you so much for talking with me today. Um, so we know that nursing home residents have not been able to have visitors for the past several months to prevent the spread of COVID, especially to the elderly. Uh, now that the visits are, are just beginning again, uh, they just started on July 15th, um, Let's just look back a, a little bit and what were you finding with the uh, people you were working with as far as isolation created by not being allowed to have visitors? It has been a really tough few months for the residents who live in these facilities. They have been without visits from family and friends. They many times have been without visits from companions who come in regularly. Um, so for a lot of our residents, they have experienced sadness. They've experienced some physical decline, some cognitive decline because they haven't had that stimulation, that interaction that is very needed. We know that so much of our physical well-being is tied to that mental and social stimulation. And and so it's been a very challenging time to balance the risk of the infection and the virus with people's mental health and well-being. And really, everyone has been very good and supportive of this process. Um, a lot of the residents do understand, but it's been such a challenge. I know it's been very hard on the families, the friends, as well as my the residents that we encounter. I know everybody's looking forward to these visits and um, getting those back up and running. So one of the reasons I was chatting with her so much at the beginning was that there was an echo on the, there was an echo on the mic and she had, um, she had a desk mic and, but the speakers were, the sound was coming from her computer. And anyway, we had to change microphones, but, um, so it's good to spend a little time at the beginning and just see how your sound is because once you start the recording, you don't really want to make a lot of adjustments. But anyway, this is interesting in Squadcast. Um, 
I was on a, a training session with them and they were, they were really, a lot of people are using that. Um, Rhonda, we actually have a question. Someone was asking, does it matter if you use a Mac or PC with uh, Squadcast? Uh, no, you can use either one. The, it is finicky in one way. You have to use Chrome. <laughs> so if you use a Mac and you're using Safari all the time, you know, I don't know how many times I've logged on and it says it's not accepting it. So you both have to use Chrome, but that's the only thing. And I think they're going to change that at some point. But um, no, either one is fine. Either one is fine. The main point is just to make sure that you have a microphone on a, and a headset on each side so you're not getting any echo. But then it's, but then it's in, um, then basically they send you, like I just, to, to take this, I go to um, download. I can either send the link if someone's going to edit it, or I download my own file into my uh, audio soft editing software, and you know that's it. I have work. I work with it from there. I don't have to do anything else with it. So that's really, it's really interesting. Now that I, I've changed microphones at different times just to see which works better, but um, I think it's I think it's really something. Um, it's getting popular. There's another similar system called ZenCaster that some people use too. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about writing, just briefly, because um, the writing is maybe not noticeable, but there, there are certain parts of it that you have to be careful with. Like, you want to write your introduction. Uh, you want to lead into the sound you have, depending on if you are going to do a two-way interview and use that, or if you're going to cut sound bites and write a narration and maybe have two or three people and some other sound. So um, you want to write into your sound bites. Like you don't want to say, uh, this is Dr. Laura Morton. And then she gets on and says, I'm Dr. Laura Morton and I'm a geriatrician. You want to just make sure that you're very concise and that like they say, don't just don't repeat it. So the sound is good. And I have a, um, I have something to play that I, I like the I like the writing on this. Um, it this is I'm gonna play I'm gonna play this one called Water Bewitched, and um, the reason I like this is. Um, the reason I like this is. It, it was a woman in my podcasting class and she's a writer and she um, did a lot of writing. She's a nature writer and she wanted to add audio. And honestly, this is the first podcast she did ever. She started from, from scratch. Um, she had this idea. She had read this book called From Where I Stand and she decided she wanted to do something and she literally started in her backyard but she made some discoveries along the way. And I, I liked the way um, she found music by going to a place in her neighborhood uh, that she found out about in her research for her story. So I just wanna listen to some of it and the elements are great. There's music, there's her introduction and she specifically says at the beginning, this is what my podcast is about. So we'll just listen. It's a six minute podcast. It's really packed. We won't play the whole thing, but um, I really like the elements in this. I'm Valerie Grace Hallinan. Welcome to From Where I Stand, where we answer the nature writer's call to connect with the land and place we call home. We moved here because they didn't cut down the trees. A split level next to a ranch, next to a colonial, next to another split level. Repeat three or four hundred times and you have Crystal Spring Valley, our 1960s subdivision. 
We live near the Erie Canal in Fairport, a suburb of Rochester, New York. Like many of the homes in Crystal Spring Valley, ours nestles underneath a magnificent canopy of maple, hemlock, and beech. The gnarled trunks of these beech trees seem ancient. They tower 80, 100 feet into the sky. It's wet here in spring. A couple of wood ducks come every year to nest near the puddles of groundwater. And when our son helped my husband build our waterfalls and ponds, they hit water just two feet down. In her book, From Where We Stand, Recovering a Sense of Place, Finger Lakes poet Deborah Tall calls us to a deep connection with the region we call home. She laments her childhood landscapes, concrete subdivisions stripped of identity with names that have nothing to do with the history or geography of the land. I assumed Crystal Spring Valley was a made-up name too. But then I found out it isn't. The water here, it isn't just any water. Local legend has it that one day in the 1880s, Baptist minister John Petty was hiking in the woods near Arundacoit Creek. The creek forms one edge of our subdivision. He came to a bubbling spring. Turns out there were half a dozen springs. The locals told Petty that Native Americans cherished the water for its healing qualities. Petty drank the water and felt revived, invigorated. Tests showed the springs were rich in iron and minerals. So Petty built a thriving Crystal Rock Water Company. The mineral water was said to aid in digestion, regulate the bowels, strengthen the kidneys, relieve headaches, quiet the nerves, and even ease female complaints and diseases. John Petty had plans for a spa where people could take the waters, but that didn't come to pass. Today, there's no trace of Petty's water company. It closed around 1905 when spas went out of fashion and the trains that carried out the water were elevated with a trestle. Every day, I walk or drive under that old stone trestle. What about the Native Americans who tapped the springs long before the water company? I went to a nearby historic site called Ganondagan, which means town of peace. Who are also known as the Haudenosaunee, or people of the longhouse. I saw a model of Ganondagan as it was in So um, I thought that was a really interesting piece because she started out in her backyard and she recorded her fountain and, and she found out that her town really, the name really meant something, you know, and then she did the, she looked up the history of this water company and then she found the Native American group. And, uh, and started looking at the history of the Native Americans and the healing water. And that's where she found, uh, she, went to a, she went to a presentation and she met this man that played the Native American flute. And you know, so, so it's kind of a progression of her story developed along with her kind of research. And when she put it all together, I thought it was really interesting because where because she called the series from where I stand and it really went from her backyard through her town and then she did she did some other uh pieces about that she did one in the northwest and uh, she's done a few podcasts like that but she's a writer so I like the way she introduced herself and she said you know it's the nature writer it's the nature writer's story basically so um that's a specific way to describe your podcast whatever your specialty is to to give it a really uh good focus so um yeah i like that piece and you know you can't always discover things like that but i think part of the mission of a podcast is maybe to discover new things like you'll discover a person or someone who plays music or a song or something interesting and um and so even when you're just chatting with people at some point there seems to be something that they say that you just think oh my gosh that's great so that's always kind of the the peak of the story to look for like the turning point uh, i think her turning point was when she she decided to look for the native americans you know and go back so that's a good one um so on these seven essential elements of a podcast um production 
Production's a lot of detail. Uh, it's about the recording. Uh, I like to remind people that you're not going to record from the, you know, you're going to record, but you're not going to use everything from the beginning to the end that you recorded. Uh, just like I was doing the, the intro and checking the sound with the doctor. Um, and you want to um, produce something that you can continue. Like one of the first things I think is important to do is figure out what your podcast structure is. Like, how will you produce it? Will you have music first? Or is it about trains? Will you have the sound of trains first? And then you'll have, you know, your little um, sound beat intro. This is about the history of sound. Or, and then you'll have, let's say, then you're going to have five minutes of a discussion or five minutes of interviews. And then you're going to wrap it up. And then you're going to have your, you know, your outro, basically. You know, this has been a, this has been a production of Syracuse University Audio Archives. And then you're going to finish with your sound or your music. And, you know, at that point, you can tell people where to find it. But the production is sort of like something you plan before you do too much recording because you want to see, you want to figure out what you need. The other part of production that is really a big problem <laughs> is uh, music. People want to take little bits of music that they love and find on the internet or they record from their favorite band and you can't do it because you'll get sued. <laughs> and, uh, and so many people, you know, they just love a song and, and they want to use it and you can't. And I have gone to different people and asked for their music. And a lot of times they will give you music uh, to use like the, like the flute. Um, so one of the best things to do is if you know people who play music, um, ask if they'll play you, you know, three minutes and give you permission to use it with their name and put their name on your podcast. Um, I do know one person, she was doing, uh, she was doing podcasts of people sort of telling memoirs, like creative writing with memoirs. And she just basically knew someone that played piano and she asked him to play her five minutes and she paid him a hundred dollars and she had music to run at the beginning and underneath and at the end of her podcast. So um, it's a, <laughs> it's a major thing. And I think signature music is something that just really strikes people. It's very memorable. So, or if it's not music, it could be a sound. Like, I mean, Radio Lab has all these crazy sounds that they use. And I love it. It's my favorite. Like, you wonder where their sounds are coming from. Um, or like the, there's a, we have a program here in our radio station. It's called Old Scratchy Records. And the man has this collection of old records. And he plays old scratchy records for an hour. But his intro is like all this scratchy, you know, scratchy noises that, that you hear on old records. So um, just think about your music or your sound. Um, I was at this sound workshop, this audio conference last year in Boston, and um, I went to one of the uh, breakout sessions and there were six musicians there and they were all now writing music for podcasting. It's amazing. And, you know, they can, and they were like people who played in symphonies. One guy was in Europe and, you know, his family was over here. And so um, there's really starting to be a business for musicians to uh, write for podcasting. And you want something noticeable, but not overwhelming. So anyway, I was really impressed that there were six people uh, that were doing this pretty much as a job. And, you know, I can understand it in Boston, you have the podcast garage, there's a lot of audio producers there, and I'm not sure, but now you can pretty much do it everywhere. So um, that's a good way to get music, and you know, it may cost a little or it may cost more. And one of the guys even said, one of the musicians said, if you want music for your podcast, just play it yourself. And you know, <laughs> um, so I have a piano and a guitar, and I, like, I just don't really play well. But I figured maybe I could play three or four minutes of music and I've tried to record it and I, it just doesn't sound good. So <laughs> it just isn't something that, you know, that seems good enough 
for me to put at the start of my, I have a podcast plan, but I don't have the music for it. So, um, so just get somebody to play it. I've asked my daughter's boyfriend to send me some of his music and I've used a little bit of that, but I haven't used it in a podcast. I've used it in little pieces. So um, just when you're in your production, just think a lot about music and sound. Uh, okay, the sixth element is distribution. Um, there's a lot of distribution so, you know, ways you can do it now. Um, we do have a, a question and it is from someone uh, about what about music created for GarageBand, Logic Pro, and the, the legality of that. Um, I think if you create it yourself, it, it's your music. And um, once we do open up um, our space again, folks will have access to garage bands and be able to do that sort of loops. If you have an Apple computer, it is Apple tuh, Mac computer. Um, it is native on the, the, um, on the uh, laptop. So I just wanted to answer that question. If it's yours, it's yours. But um, I, I think you would work out a um, contract with someone or pay them, uh, like uh, Rhonda said. So um, that is something that I just wanted to, 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 to point out. And, and there are some people that will allow you to use music like I use um, for my podcast class, I use a lot of little bits for like, here's music, read this poem, read this piece to the music and we use it to practice mixing, two track mixing. And there's a website um, called Ben Sound and he has a lot of two and three minute music up there. And he basically says, if, if you, you can use this under Creative Commons for educational purposes. And you know, you don't, a lot of things you might be able to use if you uh, aren't earning money. So I would be really careful about that, but I just use it for, for practice things. Uh, the, other, the other thing is um, you can use, there's archival music and I think it's 50 years old. There's older music that you can use uh, sometimes without copyright. But I've, I've read lots of legal documents on this and it's just, it's just very tricky. And I've done stories with music that I've gotten permission to use. And a couple of times I pulled something off the web and used like 15 or 20 seconds and they took it down, <laughs> they took it down um, off the site. So you don't want to get sued, but try to get some original music. And, and you know, the thing about the music that's already in GarageBand or something, I don't know if it would sound to, you know, canned or to record i just don't know you know you just have to see but but if you if you play it yourself uh it's it it's your if you play if you play it yourself and with podcasting you don't want to play a whole song you want you want you, you want bits and pieces of things to use you know, like maybe at the beginning maybe run under it or use it as an intermission uh you know this american life uses great sound in between their stories and i just think that's great sound where'd they get all that so just um, be careful what you use, but try to try to get something original. If you're concerned about copyright, you can also reach out to us and we can we can help. So you can always email ask at bpl uh, ask at bpl.org if you have questions about copyright. We have folks on staff. There's also the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. They're a resource here in Boston. Uh, so if you have questions uh, about IP and things like that, um, I believe they answer some questions. You can look up their website and I can link, I can send the link out um, when I send out the recording to folks. So. And there's other sound too, like one of my daughters worked in a planetarium and she wrote, wrote a three minute planetarium piece called Aurora. And it's just three minutes of sort of nice music background for a planetarium show. And it's on... Um, I think it's called the International Planetary Society. And there's a lot of uh, music on there that you can use for educational purposes. Or, you know, it's open. It, it's a site that's open to the public. So that's really, that's really kind of nice. Everything doesn't have to be music. You know, there's other sound, too. But, but that's a good uh, resource, too. Um, okay, so as far as distribution, uh, you know, there are different, um, yeah, Ben sounds good for, that's good for practicing. Um, distribution, you know, there are podcast hosts. I would read about them and decide what works for you and what kind of services they offer you. But 
Podbean, Spreaker, Buzzsprout, Simplecast, um, and then the podcast host then will send it out to the larger sites like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. And I know people always have asked about iTunes, but you have to have a certain number of episodes or something in advance. It's a pretty big production to be on iTunes, but um, but this is something you you know you look into when you sort of have your podcast. But there's a lot of options for that. Um, okay, so here's a piece I want to play because this is another way uh, to distribute your um, your podcast. I'm going to go to um, Garden Delights. So this is kind of an interesting podcast. Um, this person was, she's a landscape designer. She was in my podcasting course like a couple of years ago. And she, um, she has a business uh, and she has a blog and she wanted to add audio basically to her blog. So she would have um, sort of conversations with people because she felt like her blog was sort of her conversation, but she wanted to add audio. And so she started like on her back porch, literally, and she had a lot of um, sound and she would go on walks and everything. And, and so the good thing was she worked with sound, she recorded, she started on her back porch, she has this whole, um, she had her vision and she knew what she wanted to do and she knew she wanted to do different episodes at different seasons with different plants and critters and things like that. But um, so she started, she never, she had a lot of sound, like she had, I don't know, 12, 15 minutes of sound and she had, she didn't really edit it to the point that she was happy with it. So I got this email from her, like, I don't know, a few months ago. And she said, um, I don't know if you remember me from your podcast course, it was a couple years ago, but I finally started working with a producer and the producer edited her sound, um, set it up so it's in this structure. She has a beginning, you know, she has a middle, um, she has an end. And then on this one, you can see her distribution here. Uh, she used Buzzsprout and then, you know, it's on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and other things. But um, so this is kind of interesting because this is really, if you have a small business, I think she's a one person business, um, she just wants to send it out to people she's worked with. And um, she was also talking about how to, you know, earn more money from it. And, you know, I said, well, maybe you can get a, uh, a gardening center to sponsor you, although you don't want to work for just, you know, you don't want to be like a advertising for one garden center. If they want to sponsor you, that's one thing, or maybe you'd have a few. But anyway, um, so this is really kind of her business, um, enrichment podcast and i'll just play you the beginning because it's kind of interesting hello fellow lovers of all things green i'm mary stone and welcome to garden dilemmas delights and discoveries it's not only about gardens it's about nature's inspirations about grasping the glories of the world around us gathering what we learn from mother nature and carrying these lessons into our garden of life so let's jump in in the spirit of learning from each other we have lots to talk about Good morning, it's Mary Stone of Garden Dilemmas, Delights and Discoveries in the Garden of Life. Once again, I'm on the screen porch, it's morning time, I have my cup of coffee, and I have Ellie by my side. <laughs> you probably are hearing the buzz of a critter in the trees, that's the cicadas that always remind me of back to school. We're going to talk a little bit about cicadas today, but before I get to that, I want to just share something. I um. I took a walk at Camp Mohican, which is just up the road a piece, contiguous to the Appalachian Trail. I frequent there often, um, not as often as of late because of uh, Ellie's lameness. Um, and so I decided yesterday, let's give it a try. It's quite a steep slope as you meander up Camp Road. There's a, a racing brook, which isn't racing too much right now because we have been a little bit dry, but uh, it was trickling and it's always a lovely scent. So um, that's just like, I like the way she set it up. Her dog is always a character in her podcast, Ellie. 
and apparently Ellie is kind of older and isn't walking too well, but her dog is always there. She's always on her back porch. And she goes through, um, yeah, she said, oh, I, you know, I, I have a, I, I'm working with a producer. And so she now has um, 18, 18 episodes of her podcast, which is pretty good. <laughs> um, and, you know, they're all on different um, elements of nature, but she ties them in with holidays and seasons. There's one for Mother's Day and things like that. So um, I think she did a really good job of, she had her vision and she stuck with it. And from the very first, she was on her back porch and she was with her dog, with her coffee. And then she goes on walks and things like that. But uh, it's a good example of, she has a structure, she has a business, she has a goal. And she, also, she already has um, a lot of people who read her blog. So I, I, just, I just kind of like the way she set that up. Um, well, we could look a little bit about audio editing software. I don't know if people have done that yet or started that, but um, um, a lot of people want to start with the free audio editing software, Audacity. It's free. It's online. It's pretty good. Um, let's see. Let me go to Anne's question. Does she incorporate the podcast into? Yeah. Into the blog. Uh, yes. Yeah, she does. So that's really, that's kind of really good. And, you know, um, you basically have a lot of media, you know, in one place that you can use. And it's, it's interesting. Like I listen to that, even if I'm not she doesn't live near me, so she's probably not going to landscape my yard, but I just think she's really interesting. So um, it's great. Um, so a little bit of audio editing software. Um, there's four basic ones. Well, actually, Pro Tools as well, but Audacity is free. Adobe Audition is very, very widely used. I've been using it a lot. I've used it all the time. It's constantly upgraded. Um, you can, you have to get a subscription now to Adobe Audition. It's part of the whole creative suite. So, you know, I think it's, I don't know if you're affiliated with a university or a school of any sort, you can get a discount. But um, so, you know, out of that creative suite, there's Photoshop and all these other programs, which I never really use, but you can use them. Like there's a video editing program in Photoshop, which I use sometimes. Uh, but it's, but I like Adobe Audition. There's also Hindenburg, which is kind of getting popular with uh, radio producers, audio independent producers. It's a little bit less expensive. I've tried it and I haven't liked it better than Audition Plus I've used, I mean, I have Audition, I use it all the time. So um, I just, you know, it's what I like. Uh, Hindenburg is good. And then there's also Reaper, uh, which I haven't tried. I know that I have, um, a program that someone was teaching podcasting using Reaper. And I, I don't know if, I didn't know if it was as user friendly. Uh, but anyway, there are a couple, I have a couple things I can show you about those. Um, I won't get too much into the tools, but basically when you get into audio software, you just have to record and start using it and, and sort of get familiar with how it works. But I will show you first um, Audacity. Wally. Excuse me. Oh, you're muted. What happened? Yep. So sorry about that. I said, while you're pulling that up, I will mention that um, if people want to learn how to use audio editing software, um, Boston Public Library card holders can get access to lynda.com to learn how to, to, uh, to um, do that. Um, and uh, if people have questions about that, I can, I can talk about it at the end. So I just wanted to point that out. That's fantastic because I have used lynda.com and I love it because it's in short little episodes and you go through each one. And actually I was in a graduate program in media production and the professors were saying like over Christmas break, I'm going to like over the winter break, I'm going to, you know, get on lynda.com and learn this new program. And so it's a really great way to learn. And that's, that's a great bonus, uh, through the library, that's really good. And you know, you just do it a little bit at a time. Um, this is Audacity and um, 
I'm not going to get into too much about it, but um, uh, you basically go in and, and use the tools. I mean, you can select things like that, and then you can select a section, and you can make it louder, softer, cut it, move it, paste it. Uh, you know, you can make it, uh, you can move things around. Um, so, and there, there's all these tools you just basically have to try out. You can cut things, zoom in and out, and all that. So, um, but this is the basic Audacity window screen. Um, there are a couple of things that make it not so easy, I think. Like it has its own format, so you have to export it as a different, you know, like it's an Audacity file and and you have to export it as an MP3 or something. It's a little more complicated, but you know, it's okay to start. I find it's a little more difficult than the others to um, to move things around and to um, work with volume and things. But um, I'll play you this one piece. The seven. This, the seven, this piece I did the seven, was, um, I was, I did a ride along on the annual homeless count. So I don't know if people want to do podcasting, you know, from their desk, if they want to go out and do interviews. I love doing interviews. It's very difficult now not going out and doing interviews. Um, but um, I did this, this is a ride along. So at the beginning, I just went to the place where they were logging everybody in, uh, registering everybody, and then they were going out to do the homeless count. But I basically went along with the person who's in charge of the um, homeless shelter and I just had my microphone I rode along with her in her car so I'll just start just play a little just a little bit of this you to become homeless wait, wait I'm gonna go back here to the beginning whoops the seven that oh the seven there after she's working right yeah, yeah Patty's at work okay so right. on this evening oh, seven right. women and 21 men seeking shelter have arrived at room in the inn Bowling Green after these 28 guests have been transported to host churches for the night Program coordinator Charlie Rogers hops into her car. I'm going to head over to a local restaurant where one of our guests works. Uh, I want to check in with her. I'm not sure if she's going to stay with us tonight or not. And if she's not, I'm going to make arrangements for her to get with me in the morning so that she can do the K-Count survey. K-Count is the annual survey of the homeless done at the end of January, coordinated by the Kentucky Housing Corporation. The data is required by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and helps determine federal funding for homeless programs. Rogers knows that guests at Room in the Inn struggle to find affordable housing. Yeah, a lot of our guests work, particularly in the service industry. It takes about two and a half service industry jobs to rent a one-bedroom apartment in Bowling Green. After the stop at the restaurant, Rogers checks out a parking structure and then benches in public parks, but doesn't find anyone camped out for the night. A few blocks from Bowling Green's Fountain Square, Rogers drives slowly past one house. There was a gentleman who's been staying on this porch right here. He's in a power wheelchair. I don't see him tonight, so hopefully he's indoors somewhere safe. Then Rogers heads for tonight's host shelter for women, the Unitarian Church. That's where Room in the Inn board member Teresa Ward is assisting with K-Count. Ward goes over the cake. So, um, yeah. My husband. Uh, this is one part I like here. You to become homeless. My husband in July had a heart attack. And he had a triple bypass surgery. And about a month later, he decided, and I know it's from the surgery and things, but he left us. And he was the only income. And... We lost her home. So, um, you know, I have to say that you don't find out that stuff. This was before COVID that I went there. So you don't find out that stuff when you do things on the phone or on your laptop. And it's just, it's so different being with people. So I think no matter what kind of podcast you do, even if you're doing something on walking in the woods, you'll come along people who you meet walking. And, you know, they'll all have a story or something, you know, so, um, but yeah, so uh, that homeless story was just, I just rode along with her and then I went to the shelter. Um, but see, in those stories, then you, you need the, the narration, you know, so it was, and of course, I got people's permission uh, to use their name, to use their story. And so many people give you permission, they're in difficult situations, and they give you permission. And I think, 
one thing about podcasting is I think it's important to, you know, a lot of times have a journalistic view of it where you're using real people with real names in real situations. Um, it's just, you know, it's so much more intense. So um, that is audacity. And um, I just have one more thing I want to play. Um, and I don't know if there are any other questions at this point that we've covered a lot of things, but let's see the chat. Um, yeah. So I think, um, I think what I'll do is I have this one other piece. It's in Adobe audition and it's a four minute piece. And, um, I like it because there's a lot in four minutes and <laughs> I have to tell you that I met this girl. Uh, well, I actually found out that this teenager had done a CD about a song she wrote about the oil spill in the Gulf after the BP oil spill. And so I was going to go interview her, do something short. And then I heard her music and I thought, wow, I'm going to go meet this girl. So I went to meet her and she gave me her CD, but I wanted to record her in person. So I was, you know, if I'm going to do an environmental podcast or something, I would look for these kinds of stories because she wrote a song. She's a teenager. She's too young. She's under 18. Um, I have the school principal in there. And then I, in, I, I went to school to meet with her and I got the principal to let her go into the auditorium, the high school auditorium that was empty. And she played piano and her sister who's on the CD plays violin. And they played for me and I swear, like I'm just recording them standing there with my microphone at the piano and at them singing. And so I just think that um, if you find these people, they, you know, I feel like every sound piece should have something in it that you kind of, that surprises you. I mean, I think there are lots of podcasts that are good, but I always like to have some element of surprise. Um, so I will play, uh, this one is called um, Song of the Sea, and I'm just going to let it run. It's, it's four minutes. Mm. Wait. Aubrey Hayes was 17 when the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded. She saw the sea suddenly in pain. Broken lives and broken bones, broken place we once called home is drifting away. She's lived on the Gulf Coast all her life and felt she had to do something. As I heard about the oil spill, I'm like, gosh, this is really bad, you know? And so I called a bunch of cleanup organizations and was like, hey, what can I do to help? And so they all said, you can't really do anything because you're not 18 yet. Wanting to help is natural for Hayes. She's been part of Wings Performing Arts in Gulfport for years. The group combines the arts with community service. Well, I was worried about the animals, but I was also worried about the livelihood of the people that depend upon the sea and the fishermen and everything. One thing she knows how to do is write a song. The song is just about the different effects the oil had on the animals and the people that live on the coast. And it's kind of like my way of giving them a voice almost. It's the cry of the gold. It's the voice of the wind. It's the flash of the fish. Of the dolphin, it's the prayers of the people, it's the hope for tomorrow, it's the dreams of the children, it's the song of the sea. Hayes is one of many students doing projects related to the oil spill. Gulfport High School principal Michael Lindsay says an oral history project done on the oil spill continues to attract attention. We've had several um, people from uh, everywhere from New York to Pennsylvania that come down and, and they've even come and interviewed some of our students because um, they're doing projects on the effect of oil here on the coast and, and the way it's affected our life and the beaches. Lindsay says an internationally watched event like the oil spill 
puts the high school students in the center of many long-term issues. And not only are we you know, teaching them concepts, we want to teach them how those type of events affect our economy, the city, the whole environment. But we want them out in the community put them in some real world, real world situations. One of the real world issues that bothers Hayes most is the impact of the oil spill on the dolphins and other sea animals. She made a CD of her offering, The Song of the Sea, and she donates the proceeds, $1,300 so far, to the Institute for Marine Mammal Studies in Gulfport. Moby Solangi is director of the Institute. Getting money and having people donate money is not an easy task, but doing that, it shows their commitment and their dedication to help. And keep in mind that for human beings, you've got uh, the Red Cross, the United Way, FEMA. For animals, it's us. So Longhi says projects like the Song of the Sea show the Institute is accomplishing its mission. And having uh, stimulated the young people's minds is what, we are, what the Institute is all about. We want to have young people understand the importance of their environment, the importance of how they are associated with the entire ecosystem, how we are all dependent on each other. Hayes is graduating this spring and heading to college in the fall. With dead dolphins and sea turtles continuing to wash up on the Gulf Coast, it's likely her song will be the voice of the sea for a while longer. Rhonda Miller, MPB News, Biloxi. Cry of the gold, it's the voice of the whale, it's the flash of the fish, it's the dance of the dolphin. Praise for the people, it's the hope for tomorrow, it's the dreams for the children, it's the song of the sea. Seventeen years old. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Amber, you're muted. Oh, someone's clapping. <laughs> oh, that she was seventeen years old. And you know, it's every time I hear that, I keep thinking I'm standing in a high school auditorium with my microphone over the piano and then next to her and her sister playing the violin, who was really great too. And the two of them made this, did this song and it's beautiful. And um, yeah, so I think that's my favorite like environmental story, uh, teenagers doing good things, you know, just all the elements that, that add up to a really good story. And then the best part is like, I heard from her oh, a, a while later, like she's finished college now and she had moved to Nashville and she had done a, um, she'd moved to Nashville for her music and she did an NPR tiny desk concert. So I think she's doing well. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great. So that's pretty much on um, what I have on vision, focus, recording equipment, writing, production, distribution, audio editing, and um, there's just a lot of elements to podcasting, but it's just so much fun and sound is so much fun to work with. I don't know if folks have any other questions, but I can stand by in the chat and then we can answer them because we have about 15 minutes left. So um, I can show a couple of, I have a lot of gear. <laughs> I don't want to show too much stuff, but um, um, well, I think I, I think I won't because um, I've showed everything in the, in the, in the equipment part. So I just would say that um, when I first started doing recording, I bought one recorder. I bought a Marantz. It's an expensive one, but it's great quality. It's like, I had it, I've had it out in the rain and the snow and the heat and everything. And, um, and I bought one microphone. Um, I bought it from this 
company called Mineroff Electronics because I found them online and they did nature recording. That was their specialty. And they did uh, a lot of equipment for police. And so I was doing, I was already going outside and I wanted to um, get a new microphone. And so I asked them to um, advise me because they, you know, they had some guy out in the field recording the birds and everything. So um, uh, I started out with that one and I used that. It was an omnidirectional microphone. And so it was good for everything around rather than a focused sound. Um, but um, now I have a more, now I have kind of a more focused uh, mic I use for um, just interviews. It's, it's a, a cardioid, but, but I use that microphone and recorder for everything. I mean, I used it for so long <laughs> and then I finally decided, well, maybe I'll get another microphone, you know, for interviews. And then I started using that one. And then I have the shotgun mic, um, the shotgun mic. The one thing about a shotgun mic, it's long. And I have to say that, you know, originally it's like for if you're at a press conference or something, but um, with COVID, I have not been out. <coughs> really, really, oops. So um, I knew my dog would show up. Um, so I've done two, I've done two in-person recordings since March. That's as much as I've been out. <laughs> and so, um, the first one I did, I took my shotgun mic and I interviewed a park ranger. It was a story about a monument. Uh, and I sat on the park bench and I, we were under a tree outside. Nobody else was really around. And I held out my microphone and he sat on the other side of the bench and he took off his mask because I didn't want it, the sound to be muffled. Um, and after that, I looked up and I found that park benches were four feet generally. And I thought I really should have been a little farther away, but <laughs> it was about, it was about two months ago. So we're good. So I did that one. And then I did another outdoor recording. Um, there's a man here in town. He started a Facebook page on safe places to patronize in Bowling Green in the whole area. Cause he was saying like, we should say like, are the people at that restaurant using their masks? Are they having face shields? Are they outside? Um, are the people in the grocery store, the checkers wearing gloves? And so he started this safe places to patronize. And he has like 2,500 followers now. And everything's on there, restaurants, um, shops, uh, doctor's offices, salons. And so he was in town and I thought it's gonna be so much easier to record than to set up online and all that. So I figured he was, pretty safe because he was hosting this safe places site. So I asked him for a place to meet him and he was so funny. He said, well, you know, I'll meet you, but we have to follow all the social distancing guidelines and everything. So I met him, I went, okay, fine. So I had my gloves and my mask and my mic and everything. And so we met in the back of the house on his farm and we just stood under a tree. <laughs> And I, so I, I met, this was like just a couple of weeks ago. I measured my arm, which was about two feet and the mic. And then, you know, I was almost, I think I was six feet away with the, some space between him and me. Um, and we were outside and I did that interview. And it was interesting because, I mean, that's a great podcast, you know? I mean, people could do something like that now, you could do one on, and you know, he, and he names businesses, but he doesn't, but he monitors it so people don't say anything really bad. It's just like who's wearing a mask, who's not, which place is safe. Um, so those are the only two in-person interviews I've done in several months. Um, but you know, so it's okay doing things online, but you just don't get the same, um, you don't get the same effect. <laughs> and, and the trouble is like, you don't get them telling you things because every time you do an in-person interview and then you put away all your equipment, they tell you stuff. <laughs> they tell you interesting things that you go like, that's going to be my next episode. That's going to be my next story. So yeah, it's great. It's really fun. So podcasting is fun. I think um, if, if you have an idea, just kind of start, start going with it, start practicing recording. That's the main thing. Uh, just checking here. I don't think I see any other questions in the in the, uh, yeah. in the chat, but I have a question. Do you have any sage advice about providing focus 
to a specific idea that you have? Um, uh, yes, I think it should be mm -hmm. something you could say in one sentence. Like, thank you, Anne. Appreciate it. Um, because I worked on um, a lot of different kinds of stories, and one thing one thing that the editors make you do sometimes is say, "What is your story about?" In one sentence. Like I, I worked in Florida, and we were doing, um, we were doing radio debriefs of the stories we did. So, like, if you did a fifteen-inch story on, um, you know, the river, the pollution in the river, and you talked to all these scientists, and you just got all this information, and you did your story with all the details, and then the, and this is how we had a pot we had a radio producer in the newsroom and so he would say like so what's your story about and you know you would say like well there's pollution in the river and they don't know where it's from and it could be from a factory or maybe it's from the farm and um and and the producer finally said to me one day um because he had all of us doing these re de debriefs sometimes of our story and sometimes of other people's stories to see if we understood them or if they how they were written and he said you know Reporters write all these long things and they can't tell you what it's about, you know, so So it was really great training because um, There was a really beautiful story the one one of the one of the photographers did a story about um, I think it was a young Vietnamese woman who had died and it was about the community um, the funeral basically and sending her off and you know there were candles and everything and there was a part of the ceremony where they put the body in a boat and they sort of like floated it down the river and it was just an incredible story and so th there was the, the photos were great but there was a print part and so the editor said like what is the story about and it's not about a person who died and it's not about the boat the photographer finally said it's about loss it's about loss so if your podcast is about loss that's what you're going to focus on i mean and then you know there are other things like if i say um uh you know i'm doing story about the destruction on the gulf coast from the oil spill that's really broad so i would narrow it down to i'm it's about how the health of people was harmed by the oil spill and you know and and so i did i mean that would be one podcast theme there were other stories you know how was the environment destroyed but there were people like you know there were people who said you know uh i went to the hospital and they told me i was crazy and but yet i you know i couldn't work and i went to the hospital and i was sick and i had fever and you know i couldn't breathe and you know, and then there were other people who said um, her little nieces and nephews all of a sudden had all these ailments and illnesses and asthma and everything. And, and so there were so many different stories. And there was like a fisherman who had some kind of a rash and he could never get rid of it. And so if I just focused on how it affected the health of people, I could do a lot of episodes on that, you know, or maybe, or maybe I could do one on, um, uh, people who created music from that. Like there was a guy there that played music and he created several songs. He wrote several songs about what happened. Mm -hmm. People, some were nice, some were political, but um, mm -hmm. if you can say it in one sentence, what the story is about. I think like with the, with mm -hmm. the young woman with the um, Song of the Sea, you know, maybe that would be about how, how a young person uh, offers talent for the good of the public or for the good of the environment, you know, something really, and then you could find 20 young people who would do something like that, you know? So it just really, that whole one sense, it really gets you. <laughs> that, that's great. Actually, we have another, we have uh, someone who asked about how you can create a podcast about a visual topic, such as art or decorating or even gardening. So we talked about the gardening dilemmas and delights, but uh, that'd be interesting just to see. So it's sort of related, I guess. Uh, about a visual aspect like art or 
Well, um, let, I mean, there have been people who describe the process. Let's say you're going to do it about painters, you know, or, or no, I got a better one, sculptors. Let's say you're going to do a podcast about sculptors. Like I have interviewed a sculptor who is creating um, some statues of women and, you know, women in the state who have not been recognized before. So she has um, a foundry, like they operate a foundry where there's noise and there's, uh, they're pouring uh, whatever they're pouring, bronze, and they're, at some point they're making the mold and then they're pouring the bronze. And then, then you know, she said, come when we're doing the hammering because they're doing all the fine work in the hammering. So that, that could be uh, a podcast because you could talk to people and you could also intersperse some sound in there. I mean, for painters, uh, if it were about painting, you could talk to people, but there may be places or things that they're painting where they might go for some kind of inspiration. You know, if they're doing a landscape, if they're doing like a harbor scene, you'd go to the harbor and you would have sound of boats and things like that, which is great. So I tried to do, I'll tell you about my biggest failure in that. <laughs> I did, uh, I, I was doing a piece with this producer and we decided we were doing, we're going to do a piece about an origami exhibit. And origami is like, what kind of sound is there in folding paper? So, so we went down when they were bringing all the things in for the exhibit and they were doing some of the origami and it just like never materialized. <laughs> that was a little too, that was a little too quiet. There may be a way to do it, but it was just like, no, it's not happening. <laughs> but, there are, but there are ways to do that. There are ways to do that. Look for people and sound related to that. Any other questions? I wonder if anybody is already working on a podcast. Oh yeah. Is anybody working on a podcast? Started one? Has a plan for one? <laughs> yeah. Uh. An idea is good. Yeah, but that's how, that's all you need. That's all you need because if you have a good idea, um, you just start, you start building on it mm -hmm. and, and keep it short. I mean, the woman on her back porch, you know, the, you know, the, it, it, if you have an idea, it means you're probably going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, you have to just like allow yourself to be creative. gardening well the gardening one you know that was pretty easy mm -hmm. decorating um decorating would be i think you could get a lot of uh sound out of decor i mean you could just go like you know here's a room or here's a here's a space like here's a space and here's what i'm gonna do with it you know i'm just gonna yeah so i mean i think you could i think you can do that think about Think about how it would just happen in real life, you know, and kind of do that. Sure. You could do furniture dragging or drills, like hanging stuff on the wall. You can go through stuff. the process. Yeah. 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 I know because my daughter was here and she helped me hang a bunch of stuff. And I went, I can't do that because every time I hang stuff, like there's a hole in the wall and then I can't hang anything and it looks terrible. And I mean, I would have all that in my pod. I would have all that in the podcast. It would be so funny because that's really how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Cause we might just end up wrapping up and uh, I wanted to thank everybody who came. Yeah. Oh, so comment, just storytelling sounds like a good thing to do. Yes. Yeah. So. Everybody, uh, loves yes, everybody loves a story. So. Um, well, thank you so much, Rhonda. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, and, um, I'm sure a lot of folks had fun today learning about the process of podcasting. I know I learned a lot, um, and it got me sort of thinking about some projects I could do at work. So that's kind of exciting. Um, 
It's great. It's, it's really fun. I'm so glad everybody joined. And, you know, I think if they have an idea or they don't, just kind of go with it and see where it goes. It's a lot. It's just a lot of fun. And sound is great. It stays with you. Yeah. But thank you all for coming. It's great. Thank and you th so much. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Rhonda. I'm going to end the recording now.